based on the media stuff. God seems to speak for an hour, not, not a note, not a stumble, not a, not a stutter. And he had, some, he had some very good points. Why don't you have some shareholders? Why can't all the staff be shareholders? Why can't all the stakeholders be shareholders? I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think it's sane as we go forward. It's got to be a machine that does that. You know, if the water rises in the hog, it must, must raise for everybody, not just some. I have to think we have to make those changes. And so as technology grows, technology is getting cheaper. Even with artificial intelligence, you can go online, it's, it's what commons, it's, it's free. You can get the, techn the, the APIs and all of the stuff. There's amazing availability of stuff free. But your business, because it's a human, it's a biological system, has some other challenges. And so hopefully our clinic system will help you to upgrade your performance in your leadership styles, in your teamwork. And that's what the goal is, to be able to go in and completely rejuvenate, reorganize and re-optimize your business. So this is essentially about 38 years of my research and my life's work that I'm putting into a framework and a formula. It's my legacy. And I suddenly woke up one day and thought, what am I going to leave? Now, Emmanuel said it, it's all he had. When you go, it goes with you. Here's what I'm going to do. So, the Clerix framework is designed to improve profits <coughs> as, a, as part of the process, but it's people, planet, and profits. HPO is a high performance organization. There are guys around the world that study this at academic level. They did five years of research, 290 studies, surveys, and they came up and said, these are the things that actually impact your bottom line. Because you can do a ton of stuff. But does it actually work? Is it sustainable? Does it achieve what you're looking for? Those are the five areas that you have to address and they have their model. And I, I've got the guy's book. His name is Andre Deval. Not Deval, there's not no relationship. But it just really validated what I had in mind and it's given me the confidence to say, I've taken the world, best of the world and I've blended it with my South African 38 years of research and I have something that works in South Africa. So the C is for culture, L for leadership, engagement, appreciative action, the right mindsets and execution. That's the framework. Culture controls a large part of your output. The problem is people go into an organization, changing a culture is very hard. You can't actually change the culture. Culture is a consequence. That's the water that the fish swim in, it's the air that your staff breathe, it's the way we do things around here. Most leaders don't have the knowledge or ability to assess the culture or change the culture. But most people have got no clue. Think, if your, if your business was an animal, what would it be? If your business organization was an animal, what kind of animal would it be? And one reason why. This company you went to, the building company, they said a monkey, because it's got brains, but it's not using them. What would, your, what would your business be? And here's the scary thing. Ask your staff, and then you'll get the reality. Because here in the 30,000 foot executive suite, there's a very different picture to what it's like on the ground. So, it's by default, and it's typically destructive. It's typically where people are using 80% of their energy for defense and for, for protection. Teamwork isn't effective, there's no trust, and commitment is, I'm being paid to do, I'll do as little as I can do without getting fired. But culture is so important. It's the way we do things, you know. And the problem that you have is, you've got home culture, you've got your, your racist culture, whatever your, your race is, and then you've got a business culture. And the problem is we never ever define a business culture of this is how it is. When I play hockey, when you get on the field, these are the rules, this is the deal, these are the agreement, these are the rules of engagement. You don't get on that field unless you agree to those, that culture. But in business we never do that. Tony Shea, anybody heard of Tony Shea, Zappos? Little, they're a call center, an internet website company and a call center there. They got bought by um, Amazon for a billion, not billion dollars. The owner of that business had a company before that he sold because he said the culture got so bad he hated waking up in the morning to go to work. 
culture is the foundation of your success. And he says, when you're starting a new business, day one, culture matters. When you try and employ, when they want to employ people in their company, one, do you have the technical competence, technical expertise, competency, skill sets? Two, do you fit our culture? You don't fit the culture? Sorry, you might be the best in the world. You don't fit our culture? Goodbye. One or two, not going to kill your culture. Three or four or five will smash your culture. Out of a hundred people, six will destroy your culture. Culture is very, very important. So, I actually did, if you open your sheets quickly, if you open your, your pages, um, open your, your, if you should have, have your pens, we can give you there. But I wanted to make it an interactive part of the process. Um, I just want to see which one it is. It should be right towards the back. Yes, it is. It's got this it's revolutionary workplace quick scan. It's the second one from the back that we put in. So think of one thing that you believe needs to change in your company culture that would make it a better place to work. Turn that one over. There we go. You're not, you're not going to have to share it. I just want to get you to start thinking. What is one thing different that you want in the basic organization? Must people take more initiative? Should there be more tolerance? Um, should you know, greater accountability, greater ownership? Greater, what is the one core dynamic of your business space that would actually make a positive difference in your organization? My goal is that you, you walk away with something actionable from here today that you can say, right, this is what we're going to be talking about and getting people to walk the talk. You know, often people, they want certain values like growth and opportunity and feedback and connection, but they're getting separation, division, people are hoarding information, they're not sharing information, you know, but silos. And those all just, they, they destroy the high performance potential of an organization. What is the one thing that's, that's the oxygen and the water and the air that your business floats around and that, that all the staff are exposed to? What's the one thing that if that changed, your, your performance would change? We actually have assessments that you, it's, it's values based assessments. What, are you, what is your personal values for the workplace? What are you getting? What do you want? And you'll be astounded because the problem that you now have is you've got racial differences in, in values expectation. You now certain people want growth and opportunity, other people want integrity and accountability. And now how do, you, how do you manage that? Because you've got different tribes in the organization, they have different priorities and values. And that's as a leader, you've got to find a way to manage those things. But it's got to become a, a part of the ethos, a part of the fabric of your business because it's 50 to 60 percent of the results of your business. And the problem is when somebody new arrives, if you don't have an onboarding process, the disengaged guys take him. Watch out for that. And because he's new and uncertain, they suck in everything. Suck in the whole shooting match, and it may not be the truth, but it's the truth of the disengaged. And suddenly your culture starts to go do, 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 do. and next thing the tipping point hits and now you've got help. So what is one thing that you, you could change? At least for leadership, limitless leadership. Leadership is so important. When I was doing my research, that elephant that we spoke about, that poor elephant, some guys wanted to know what is the strength of an elephant? And so they put a, a, a yoke on the elephant and they did a tug of war. 20 men, 30 men, 50 men, 80 men, about 105 men, this, is this Nelly, the circus elephant, 105 men were able to do the tug of war with her. One guy stood up and said, no, 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 I think I can do better. Leader. With 60 people, he achieved working together, aligning them together, he achieved what the 105 were able to do with good leadership. Here's my question, are you a good leader? You might think you are. Go and check in the mirror. If you really got if you got if you're brave, ask your staff. 
but we, we should let them be honest. Because we'll come and do it for you. We'll give you an honest moment because yes. as third party external people, mm. we, could, we do those processes. Some people get a very big wake up call. Mm. Like most of the time, executives get a very big wake up call when they realize how sick the fabric of the organization is. They think, but they've never had a conversation to get it. And you're right, people are too scared to. But leadership is such an important thing. But not only for you, on every level of the organization. You have to distribute accountability and authority right to the call face where people are in with the customer. I'm sorry, Mr. Customer, I have to follow this policy or this procedure, or I have to check and get back with you. Now, some companies have got manuals like this for policies and procedures and that. Other companies like Zappos, there are 10 things. Make the client happy, do the best you can, don't waste, got, I'll find them, you can have a look at them. Use your best thinking. And that for me is good. You want to bring out the best in the person. You, you want their heart and their soul that work, not just read the policy manual, page 47, from what it says. <laughs> and also, and, and here, here's the thing. The research shows South Africa, 70% of leaders aren't leaders. They, in the leadership position, they're not doing leadership behavior. And they, in fact, are, are what I call greeters and bleeders. They are destroying the culture. They're destroying the dynamic of their business. Without them, the country, the, the, company would run better. 8.4 times, if you have the right mindset as a leader, you're up to 8.4 times more valuable. 8 times, that's 840% more valuable in the impact that you have. And for me, the leader's job is to make more leaders. That's the fundamental goal of the leader, is to every single level of the organization, which is what I call limitless leadership, that you put leadership down to the ground. So as a leader, the number one thing that you can start to do, this is the work of Professor Lasada, is to show, ensure that the, the dynamic of conversations is more positive than negative. It takes three positives to neutralize one negative. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It takes three positives just to neutralize one negative. You ideally need five or six positives against any negative. Using this formula alone, they are able to predict the success of a relationship, a team, or business. What's your ratio? Make sure that you have a minimum of three. Ideally, four, five. Not 10, 11, 12, because then you're smoking something bad. That's not ideal. Social network analysis. So, you might be the leader. And this is your organizational structure. But I promise you there are people in your organization that have got more impact than you. I think it was Boeing or one of those large organizations try to implement a whole system using, their stru using that structure. 18 months, two years, they couldn't get it implemented. Somebody then thought of, let's find out who the leaders are, the real social leaders are within the organizations. They trained them, they got them on board. In 18 months, they did what they couldn't do in two or three years. And it's what we call tribal leadership. I did some work with Liberty. Lady came in from um, maternity leave, new broom sweep clean. This is our da 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 and she's pushing around. Left brain accountant, the four managers underneath, they're the tribal leaders. No. And so they just blocked everything. So it got to the point where she was crying. She says, I don't know what to do anymore. So we went away for, for a one-day team building, and I did my research, and I said, do you want to solve it? Yes. I said, on zero to ten, how important? Ten. GPS, signal lost. Oh. Hmm. So I went to her, and I said, right, here's what you need to do. I went to these guys, I said, are you prepared to do this? Yes. Put them together. Sorry, apologize, please forgive me. I love you. Hugs, kisses. Teams flying. Little things matter. Like that. Finding out who the controllers are. And in tribal, if you understand tribal leadership, because I, I use um, tribal leadership, I can't remember the guy's name. I use all the new neuro leadership from David Rock's work. Um, I use Lance Secretin's leadership of higher ground leadership principles. Leadership is the foundation of our life. Self leadership, business leadership, team, country. Without that, nothing matters. People talk about leader, leaderless teams, can't happen. 
It can't happen when there's, when there's no leadership initiative within the, within the group. It just flowers. People do nothing. So what is one thing that you can do, that you ought to do, need to do, should do, could do, would do, to clarify or improve your leadership? We did some work with OPP in Eastern Cape. They've got a powerful little lady leader there, and there's some men leaders. Vusi was one of the guys I wanted to steal him. He was a, he was a black version of me. <laughs> and I wanted to steal the guy to come and be my partner. And he said, no. I said, but you can earn like double. He says, I'm not here for the money. I'm here for what I do for my community. But she wasn't leading them in the way they needed to be led. So we set up a thing. They will, they will assess her. And if she doesn't improve within a year, she'll resign. You ought to have Belugas to make that choice. You know, get serious about success. Get serious about leadership. We need more leaders. We need perfect leaders. So what's one thing that you could do to be a better leader? I'm going to write one point or two points there. What is the one thing that you could go and do actionable today? The problem with life is we have so much theory and no, no action. Number two, limitless leadership underneath there. So what is one thing that you could do to change your culture? What is one thing that you can do to improve your leadership? Number two, leadership impact. Are you guys good to have a break? Quick, quick coffee and loo break and stand up. Okay, so when, when you've written something, grab a cup of coffee, the loo's out there, put some places on the left. Are you getting value? You enjoy it? I'm concerned some people may not be getting it. No. Prudence, so you can switch off the camera for the moment there. Thanks. Leadership? Yeah. Network analysis is actually quite profound because in doing that, I spent a few hundred hours learning the software and the system. But when you start to see where trust flows, and where communication flows, that's different to your organizational structure, the organizational chart. I did work with a company that had a problem of credibility and leadership, and then I did the social network analysis and I found that the leaders that they had in positions weren't the leaders that had the ear of the people. And then we did the trust flow, and the trust flow was nowhere near the leadership at the top. <coughs> so it's, it's very it's like an X-ray machine thing through the process. Alright, so one thing that you can do to, to make sure that you're a better leader, and I think you also have to find a way to embed leadership into your organization, what I call limitless leadership, so that when you're not there, the machine runs without you. That's the challenge. If you're the machine, when you stop working, the machine stops. And that's part of my challenge, where I'm digitizing all my knowledge. Um, you've got to build ways of, of growing that leadership, and it's not always easy. Because it's self-worth, self-esteem, identity, a lot of inner work. Uh, I didn't put the slide up, but at least 88% of success in leadership is, is the inner work, and 12% is from the outer stuff. Because you're the autopilot. Yeah. Autopilot. <laughs> and then engagement and energy. Uh, Gallup, or Gallup's research around engagement is very powerful work. They're Q12, and there are other assessments. But engagement is directly related to leadership and management effectiveness. Yes, happiness at work brings in the dynamics of choose your own happiness, and where staff have half the, the impact on that. But engagement is directly related to the management style. And in South Africa, we've got very high levels. On a global level, we close to double the global um, disengagement level. And that's destructive in an organization. You know, people, people think money's a motivator. Money's a motivator to a point, but eventually, it, you can add, add another zero to your life. Is it going to motivate you much more? Not really. The, the reality is most of the people in our workplace are underneath that, that line. Money is a motivator for happiness for them to a point. Um, and we've got to find ways to change that you bring meaning as well. And I think if you're going to get the whole person at work beyond just what they, they've been paid to do, it has to go from money to money and meaning. Now people will, what's it, they'll work for a living, but they'll die for a cause. What's your business cause? Now when you come and say we're going to double sales, whoopie do. <laughs> you know, but we're going to save humanity. Now it's here, but I could make my attention. 
when you do some really big stuff. Big elevated levels of stress and frustration. There's some, I've been in some workplaces where the fear is so high from making a mistake you're doing nothing. So be careful how you create the workspace, how you engage the people. Is it safe to make mistakes and learn? Now Watson, the guy from IBM, a very long time ago, he made a mistake, cost IBM $20 million. And the guy went to the boss and he said, I suppose you want my resignation. And the guy says, don't be silly. We just spent 20 million dollars <coughs> educating you. You stay in. <laughs> I thought that's a, that's, a good, that's a good mindset. And so, as a leader, you have, to, you have to create the platform for your stars and your superstars to shine. So many leaders and business guys are involved in the day-to-day -day tactical stuff. I think it's a waste if you're a leader. You've got to empower and energize and enable and create a platform for high performance results. Because you're the one who's got the power to say yes, no, at, at the ultimate level. Is your place a place where people can achieve their best and utilize their talents fully? How do you create a place where it's energizing? Very simple test. Would you tell, would you refer your best friend to come and work here? <laughs> what happens if they say no? Um, is it a good idea though? Would you recommend? I mean, is it just well, G Gallup's research shows one of the questions is I have a best friend at work. Friendship, being able to connect and communicate is once again that heart energy. It allows you to have a place to express authenticity and honesty. It allows you to de stress. You do have to be careful though because if your best friend and you are both disengaged, you start to become, you know, wherever two or more, wherever two or more are gathered, um, you start to have power. So, if you're going to lose one, you might lose two. If they're engaged people, hey, great, great stuff. You know, this old command and conquer process, uh, command and control, I think is done. Unless your organization is a military organization, or you're under extreme duress, and it's got to be what I say goes and do it. But the line between work and life is blurring. And your phone's on 24-7. Your staff's phones are on 24-7. You, you, from 5 in the morning till 7 at night, you're with these work people. Why not, why not have people that you love to be with? You do have to... You know, I think it's like the mafia. If you're going to have some kind of authority, there's, there's got to be a very clear line of Here's my role and function, here's what I need, and if that changes, that there's a disobedience of some kind, or, or it's going to conflict with the workspace, then you have, to, you have to talk about it. But it's like having relationships at work. It's great while they work, when they don't work, it's, it's hell. And it affects and impacts everybody. It just permeates everywhere. So you've got to be careful of those things. But you have to address it quickly. If there is a problem, you've got to cut it very, very quickly. So, how do you create a platform for your staff to be the best, to activate their talents, to activate their mindsets? Do any of you have a library at work? A video library, a book library, an audio library for your staff to learn? Why not? And that's Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. Great book. Every one of your staff should have read it. If not read the whole book, get, get your staff member to read one chapter and summarize the chapter. Let them present to it. When I had my computer business a long time ago, every morning we had training in the room and every one of my staff eventually had to get up to the front and talk about something. They had to, if they were a smoker, they had to talk about why smoking is bad. <coughs> so they had to argue for the opposite side of the, of, the, of the picture and they would stand up and speak there and eventually they would come and stand there and eventually I would sit down while they spoke. And my secretary, I met her a while ago, she said, you know, the best thing that I ever learned that I ever got with you guys. So I learned to speak with confidence in front of people. Mm. As a, as a, she was a receptionist. Mm. So I believe you've got to have, with the guy that did my printing, Justice, he's got books on his table. I take all my stuff when he makes duplicates or stuff. I give him a copy for him and his staff. Read, learn, grow, sow seeds. You know, this is a, this is a muscle. You've got to grow this thing. Mm. Put stuff in. If you want your staff to be the best, 
Are you giving them the best? If you want them to be strong, are you feeding them the right stuff? <coughs> uh, if you're a manager, you need to understand this. Whatever actions you do. Sorry. So, we know from the work of David Hogg, <coughs> now we've got these scientifically measurable process to get into someone's brain. We now know, we don't think, we know exactly how the brain works. We know what kind of things put the brain on alert. We know what kind of things put the brain into calm and peaceful. The brain is at least three to five times more filtered for danger protection defense. The amygdala's number one job is am I going to be okay? Will this eat me or can I eat it? So whatever you're doing goes through this filter of is it dangerous? Is it threatening my status? Is it taking away my certainty? Are they removing my autonomy? Are, am I related, connected? And is this fair? I'll tell you, fairness. I was in a situation where I was like a glass ball. I was watching a person in a business. Fairness will take them from the most engaged, happiest, committed, most committed staff member to destroy that energy. Just with fairness. You treat him better than him? They've got monkeys in a cage. They feed one monkey peanuts, the one monkey a peanut piece of green lettuce. And you see how the jealousy builds, the unfairness, and how the one goes mad. That's little monkeys. What do you think humans do? I've seen it. Now you pay one person more than another. They work, you don't. And what normally happens to your good workers that you can rely on, you trust, you load them more. And the slackers get nothing. What do you think it does to the brain of the worker, the good worker? This is not fair. The moment you have not fair, you have a huge problem. So, so what about this new thing we buy um, equal pay for the same job? Um, I think that's the same as equal pay for the same performance. Um, I, I can't accept the same job. I, could, I believe with the new technology and the way we're going, it's got to be the value that you add. You've got to, you've got to be rewarded. If I, if I add seven, if I got the right mindset and I add seven times more value, Reward me seven times more. But you can't have two people where he's working like crazy, comes in at six, leaves at six, delivers <coughs> three times my output, and earns the same money because it's the same money for the same job. That's for weak people. That's, that's for slackers. So it could be detrimental. Uh, not could, it is. Because it is a new policy. Huge problem. We will, Africa will never become world class based on that policy. Mm. What's the incentive to do more? There's no incentive when we're driving. If you don't pay for water, do you value water? Just because the people leave the tap running. If you don't value electricity or pay for electricity, you just leave it running. If you're getting rewarded for doing as little as possible, the moment you do that, that unfairness button is going to be hit so hard because the guy that's working like crazy, absolutely. And so your high performance is dead in the water before you even start. And that then permeates throughout the machine. And now you start to employ Dane Lux, a Lane Dux. <laughs> Lane Lux. <laughs> so, so what's one thing that you can do to increase the workplace energy and engagement? What's one thing that you can do differently back in your workplace that'll get people more connected, more engaged, more involved? You need to scrape it on your number three. On your sheet. Something actionable that you can go and do. Simple things. What's one simple thing that you can create better engagement, better involvement, more meaning, more energy, more inspiration? Because here's the reality, there's so much you can do. And so we get overwhelmed and do nothing. Just take one of these things and implement for 30 days. Two weeks. Take another one, implement it. Or just do a week. This week we're doing this, and start to embed it, and walk the talk, and get it to become inculcated into the system, into the machine. But then also ask staff, what do you think, what else should we do, what else can we do? Get involved and get contribution. And the next one I'm going to show you is A, the appreciative. We use a process called appreciative inquiry. What happens when I say, why is this thing not working? What happens to the person's energy the moment I point and question, it gets defensive. Yeah. It's human nature to defend and protect and block. 
So instead of using a deficit-based approach of what's the problem, we come from the other side and say, what do we want more of? So instead of saying, what is workplace, how do we stop workplace harassment or how do we stop workplace uh, slackery, we say, what does a high-performance team look like? What does a great workplace look like? Instead of saying, how do we stop theft of, of luggage at the airport, what does a great experience look like coming through the airport? So you get the flip, and the, the approach number one is from a positive approach. So what do you want more of? So the, the, the center part, it's a positive core. We come from a positive expectation. Then we do discover what gives life. So think for a moment. Think about a time in your life when you're part of an amazing business. Something that made it absolutely amazing. Think about it. You're part of a team, saw a leader, something that like, mesmerized you, got you inspired, engaged, energized, electrified. What was it? What was it that made it so great? What were the qualities, the characteristics, or the principles that made that experience so positive? Things for me, it's where I was part of a team and we were contributing to something bigger than ourselves. Part of a system where I was learning new stuff. Where I was given full responsibility and authority to make absolute whatever the decisions were. I was nervous, but I had that responsibility that I could take. So you go, you go back into memories of positive past experiences. That energizes you. Then from there we go to design. Sorry? We dream. So from a positive frame of mind, just for the moment, imagine, let's go a year in the future. Imagine that everything you learn today, here you apply. And your business doubles. Become a high performance company. Everybody successful, running positively, amazing work. <coughs> what does that look like? What's different? If you, if you kind of go forward into a year in your mind and you're like, where, where are your offices? What's on the walls? How are people different? What's the culture like? What's the leadership like? What's the language? What are the relationships like? And so we do, using appreciative inquiry, we do, we do our whole process of going to the future. What does that look like? Using this positive reference. If you've done it once, you can do it again. If you've been part of it once, you can be part of it again. So what does that future look like? Then we come back and design it. Okay, so what do we need to do? What did you see? Tell me, what did you see differently in your business? So staff, stop, so staff highly energized, motivated, inspired, taking action on their own without you having to push wet string uphill. So then the design would be, how do we do that? Step one, what do we do? Step two, what do we do? Step three, what do we do? Step four, what do we do? So you start to design a machine and a place and a platform where people are motivated, where people are inspired. You know, motivation is manipulation. Because who motivates you? The boss. Because the boss wants more sales. But inspiration is within. Breath from within. Inspirari, the breath of God from within. So how do you go from motivating to inspiring? It's that shift. Because, Travis, put up your hand. Why are you pushing? In my whole life, I've done that only once an Indian guy didn't push. <laughs> <laughs> Fell on my face. <laughs> <laughs> For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. You go to your staff and you push down on something, they'll find a way to push back. Mm -hmm. Human nature. Mm -hmm. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So how do you bring out the best within you? What's going to shift for you? To be collaborative, where you avoid blaming and naming and shaming. You get everybody involved. You want, to, you want people to take ownership? Get them involved in the process. Get their input. Get their opinion. Get their suggestions. Ask yourself, how do we stop all waste? 100% waste. What do we do? Start to get them creative. Get them thinking. Get them innovative. In the future, you're going to have to be an entrepreneur in your business. Within the business. You might be the entrepreneur only in the business. But your staff need to be entrepreneurs and find opportunity and creativity within that organization as well. Because we need to be resourceful and responsive. You've got limited resources, how do we get the best out of it? And how do we handle what's in front of us? Stuff moves so fast today. I phoned the guy, I said I need a quote. So they give it to you in 10 minutes. 
He came back 45 minutes later. I said, I'm sorry, Dan. My client went to the half an hour ago. Dan, lost, next. He just, he just lost 50 grand. We need fiercely focused actions and agility, but using this positive process, we do the discovery, the dream, we design it, and then we go and do it. Hold people accountable. We said we're going to do this. We measure this, we measure that, we take action for this, we take action for that. We have conversations about it, meetings about it, but it's a fiercely focused one thing at a time, not ten things. One thing at a time. And it becomes embedded into the culture, into the psyche, into the norm. When people come, they know this is the deal. Every Friday, 9 to 10, training and meeting. Respect it, whatever. You will have a chance to talk every time. Whatever you're, whatever you're going to do to build the culture. So what is one thing that you can do with this appreciative process, with the action that you can do to improve the workplace? What fiercely focused action can you take using a positive, safe, inclusive approach that you can do to get input and participation and ownership from your staff? Now we normally do this like a full appreciative process over a three day process. And then there's implementation out of it. But it's, it's a full system. We get the whole, the whole group, the whole system in the room. And there's an incredible work of doing that where you get everybody that's impacted and involved. There's conversations, there's negotiations, there's communication, there's agreements, there's plans, and there's action. Nothing matters without action. What one shift can you make in the way you involve your staff, in the way you approach your problem solving? Getting them to belong, to participate, to connect, to take ownership. At the end of the day, you want ownership and accountability. Inspired. And then the R is right-mindedness. People have to be ready. You cannot, you know, same, same pay for same job. It's not going to have the same mindset. And so that for me is, is the challenge. Is skill set with a bad attitude is probably worse. I'd rather don't want that. Well, they give me five people who are on fire with the right mindset, I'll, you know, higher, higher for attitude, train for skill. Secret. Higher for attitude, train for skill. It's so much easier to upskill a person than to up attitude a person. Most, most managers are not able to up attitude a person. But they just, they have a struggle with themselves. And that's why as a leader, you've got to become, uh, you've got to get into the mind. You've got to understand people. You've got to have the sensitivity of how you're impacting, how this person runs, how this, this mental <coughs> firmware and operating system runs. That's why I like hacking human software. Mindset, tough skill set. There are 20 qualities that, from the work of uh, Professor Stoltz that they've tra traveled the world to discover what are the top 20 mindset qualities that are most valuable in a workplace. Think about yours. What are the top three mindset qualities that you want of your stock that will make them more valuable to you. Do you ever talk about them? Do you ever stop long enough to think about them? How do you measure them? It's easy to do a, a test, a skills, a skills test. In a, do you know how to do Microsoft Word or Excel? Show me. How do you do a mindset check? And so all of the, the managers, 96% of the managers said, yeah, skill set's vital, but we don't know how to check for it. And so for me, it's the resilience. You know, IQ is important, EQ is vital, but those two without the ability to bounce back off this stress, pressure, challenge, knockdown, they have no value. So it's so important that you can rethink. My book was originally called Rethink, but uh, I changed it to Swift. But we do, we have to stop long enough and rethink how we're doing it, rethink what we're going for. You know, these vision, mission, values of to be the most admired company, most profitable, it's not inspiring for staff. Platitudes on the wall. The next question is you've got a set of values. Do you walk the talk? Ask a staff many times. You know, what's, what's good for the wall isn't good for the boss. The boss doesn't do that. And the PA always says what the boss is doing. The boss thinks there's secrets. There's no secrets. There's no secrets. So what's one thing that you can do around psychological capital? You know, psychological capital is resilience, um, self-efficacy, self hope, and confidence, and there's one other. But the stronger your staff's identity and self-worth, self-esteem is, the stronger the team. And that's what I've always done with my team building, is address the individual, then the team. You can't build a great team with weak individuals, with 
bad, bad identity, you know, self, negative self-talk. It's just it's not, not going to be a strong team. The weakest link is where you have the problem. So think about it. On your piece of paper, number five there, what's, what are the top two mindset qualities that will make staff more valuable to you? And how do you, how do you go and improve it? How do you... And so the final one is execution. The X in clear X is execution. You can have all of these great things, but where the rubber meets the road, if there's no plan, accountability, and process, execution is the, the exponential amplifier. How good is your execution? That's where most people fail. You've got a huge strategy document that nobody understands. It's too complex. They go away for hospital for three months, for three days. They pay two million bucks to get it, and then no one looks at it. You need like a one-page strategy document that there's clarity and focus on, on what is it? What does it look like? Because these, the, your time horizons and event horizons, disruption is the norm. Disruption used to take five years. I promise you, now disruption is down to months. Think of people like Uber. They own no stock. Biggest taxi, ta taxi service in the, in the world. Uh, Airbnb, they own no stock. They rent out more rooms than the biggest hotel groups in the world. Uber just got three and a half billion investment from the United Arab Emirates sovereign fund. Not even an entrepreneur fund, a sovereign fund. Now think about the self-driving cars. Who's going to have, you're not going to have insurance. The whole industry disappears overnight. There's disruption coming in every dimension. In HR, all of the things that HR does is going to become an act. So, and that, but that's moving so, so quickly nowadays. Competition is growing. Now, for me, when I started speaking, my competition was Johannesburg. Then it was kind of the country. Now my competition is the world. The moment the internet came, our competition went from like 100 to 20,000. You have to be outstanding. You can't just be average. Average is death. Average is dog food. You have to find ways to be outstanding. With great value. Exceptional value. And it's constant change. But you, you've got to come from a strength approach and, and your staff people spend millions of change <coughs> management. You don't want to have change management anymore. You want to have changes daily. It's got to become, when I go fishing on a jet ski, it's like this, the whole day. There's no time that it's ever like to sit. The water's burned out in the ocean, it's never like that. And it's constantly balancing, holding. And you've got to become happy with that. People have to become happy with uncertainty. People can stick and hold on to certainty. You have to have, be able to reorganize your business around a new shift in the market quickly. You can't have... Six months to a year, come to the market with an idea. By that time, competition's seen, done it, out in the world, going. We have to become a lot more agile nowadays. And execution isn't this kind of execution. Because I promise there are places with execution, you make a mistake, it's like a career limiting move. You can't have that. If you want the best out of people, you can't make it dangerous. Understand there are high pressure environments. If you're a pilot, you're a surgeon, you don't want to, oops. But then you've got to choose the best. You can't have be rules and have the same job, same pace. You know, you, you've got to have, it's got to be merit. The guy's got to have the competence to do the job. And we've got to build that into the machine that people stretch and they grow. When I played my, my first level, you know, provincial level of hockey, you put an apprentice guy on the field, he's going to get eaten. Every guy in that team's going to smash him. Because he's going to stop the team. And then teamwork is what's going to make that whole thing happen. So, the quality of your strategy and the, and the quality of your strategy there, you want to be in the zone. Great strategy, great execution. You know, people love to win, but you can't let people win in a year's time. It's too far away. It's got to be like weekly, monthly, quarterly wins. Keep that inspiration, keep that involvement, keep that meaning. If I say to you, you know, do this and this and this, and at the end of the year, I'll give you a bonus, it's like the brain doesn't even think that far. You've got to find a way to make execution with ownership and accountability, direct accountability, clear. When people don't perform, you've got to have a way as a manager to say, listen, some coaching. Some more coaching, some more coaching, done, goodbye, next. If you're not an A team player in my A team, you've got to go to the B team. And we've got to find ways to get people to come in that mindset. 
You can't just, you know, same job, same pay. Uh, you, that, that, that's death. It's absolute death. So what's one thing that you can do to improve your execution? That you can get people to take action, to stand accountable. And for me, the number one thing is give them ownership. Get them involved in the decision-making process, get them involved in innovation and the planning, and give them full ownership. And then meet once a day, how's it going, what's happening? But you don't take away any kind of control, it's just a check-in, like a coach. How are you doing today? What's the thoughts? Have you considered? For them it's, it's much more valuable because you've done something on your own. You've been given authority, you've been given accountability, recognition. Number one issue that I find in companies, validation, recognition, appreciation. How do you validate and recognize somebody who's just doing just the minimum for their job? Give them extra, give them opportunity to go beyond the line. And so for me, clear X is about people, plans and profit that's, that fixes stinking thinking. That it fixes learned helplessness, that it addresses... This is where people don't have the power. It's this emotional static and this learned helplessness and thinking. And that's what drives it. If you can't change those things, training has got no value, no benefit. Coaching can to a point, but not completely. You know, adding value. At the end of the day, business is about adding value and having an energy. People don't eat right. They don't think right. They, they're overweight. My, my ex-brother-in-law is a risk manager for a very big accounting firm. He had a stroke at 148 kilos. And I'm saying to the big boss, 148 kilos is not healthy. That's a risk. What are you doing to manage your company risk? Because he's an international level guy, flying around the world. They fly to Emirates for an hour's meeting. What are you doing to manage that risk? Nothing. So, you know, if they, if they make value, you've got to manage those risks. And then distraction and inaction. We get distracted by stuff. On my PC right now, there's probably 50 windows open on two screens. I promise you I'll spend at least an hour a day trying to find which window I'm working on. <laughs> Just where was it now? Was it this one? Was it now? No, hold on a second. Fierce focus. Give your people just one thing or two things, not a not hundred things. And so the goal is to give you maps for every one of these situations that you can map out here's where we are, here's where we want to be, as next step. That everybody understands where we are on the plan. Otherwise people are staff are just hoping, they're working on hope. This is an example of a customer journey map. What are the stages, what are they doing, what are they thinking, what are they feeling? If you did this with your staff, you'd be astounded with the insights you'd get. Find out where you're losing customers, where you're losing customer satisfaction. But it gives them insight too, and you can then give ownership and say, you know, here, yeah, over here, you've got to, you've got to make sure that you, you handle that correctly. So the framework is a proven, tested, reliable system that will help you optimize people and your profits. I'm suggesting we bring Planet into the process because it's, it's good thinking and good business. We know from, from our work, I'm certified for science of happiness, but recognition, like I said, is an issue. Pride. Give them something to be proud of. And profit isn't a pride factor. And trust. You've got to build that trust. You've got to, you've got to trust them and you've got to be trustworthy. And you've got to build it into the process as a culture, as a dynamic culture. To help them achieve their potential. If you get them to achieve their potential, activate their talents, you can create an incredible team. But you then have to align the team all together like the elephant story. And for me, you've got to go under this line. Training is not going to do the job. In our country, it's not going to do the job. We have to get into the mindset part of the person. We talk about growth mindsets and fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. <coughs> How you praise people controls fixed or growth mindset as a kid. The fixed the growth mindset, they're good for challenges. They, they find ways around issues. This is what we want our people to have. Whether they're in our organization or impacted by our organizations, if you're doing stuff into society, that's how we're going to build our country, is by changing the mindsets of our people. And I think as a business, you have the responsibility of those that you impact, your stakeholders, to also infect their mindsets. These are the top 20 mindset qualities that managers want. Which one stands out for you as the most valuable? Choose one. <coughs> oh, 
I will tell you the secret. Number one is commitment. Number two is honesty. Number three is trust. That they're in order this way. But what are the qualities that you need? This is a diagnostic. One of the diagnostics we use to go into an organisation when when there's no need to pretend to be something. We go and do a third party assessment and then we come back and show you anonymously what the what the data is. We'll scare the heck out of you to discover how your machines really run and what people really think. This is a dashboard for the individual that we understand what it's their resilience, their emotional intelligence. This guy's got baggage. That's his emotional baggage, that's the, that's the mental, and that's affecting him here. This is my X-ray machine in when I look at this, this is my dashboard on a Ferrari. There's a problem with teamwork here. He's got baggage from the past. There's no trust in the leadership. Fairness is an issue. The motivation is low in the team. His energy, he's got extreme stress levels. Trust is reasonable. The job drag is extreme. He hates his job. This guy's going to be in, in hospital or he's disengaged. But that's our power. It's my 38 years of, of research to design a, a dashboard like that. We then use, this is from, from the, the uh, International Society for Performance Improvement. It's a process. What's your vision and mission? What performance do you want? What are we actually getting? There's a gap. Why is the gap? Any one of these issues. How do we fix it? Do it, assess it. Your environment, your, co co your context actually has impact beyond the person. Improve performance, reduce the gap. And so that's a process and that's an individual process for each person because what affects him will be different for him. So as part of our process is individualized to be able to understand each individual soul. There are external forces, but the most power is right here. Identity, needs, fears, beliefs, values, behaviors, mindset. And that, if that impacts everything else. If you don't have the heart of this thing sorted, you, you're throwing bad off the good. And what happened to my uh, team viewer? Sorry. My team viewer just timed it out here. Okay, okay. I'm going to just get. We also use stuff like Blue Ocean Strategy for your business. Red Ocean is where you're competing with the 100,000 other people, margins are cut. So we teach you to use a Blue Ocean process, new opportunities, new markets, new innovation, where you have less competition. And it's a, it's a whole process that we take you through. So, my question for you is, in the last minute or three, is your place a great place to work? Is it? Do you want it to be? Yeah. Then come talk to us. We'll, Emmanuel and I and Andre, we'll find ways to, it might just be a small thing that we come and get involved in, it might be a whole big soul surgery system. <laughs> I like the soul surgery, because that's where change, there's always tears, there's always laughter, and there's always life-changing experiences. If there's, if there's no emotion in the process, it's just here. Mm -hmm. It's like reading a book. It has no value. Who's read a book before? Did you implement the whole book? <laughs> Research shows people, less than 10% of people read past the first chapter. So, if you want to improve your culture and your business, we need to address people, teams, and leadership through our, our process. <coughs> these, are some, these are some of the results we've had with government, non-government. We can do the same for you, and we'd love to. But we're the world's waste of impact. We take no prisoners, we do stuff you can't read in a book. And Emmanuel talks, and I didn't really understand it. He used to say, I hated going after Tony when we were doing the workshops. And I didn't really understand because the problem that I have is I live in this. It's like paragliding. When I run off a mountain, I've done it 100, 200 times. The fact that the ground suddenly falls beneath me for 500 meters and I'm floating on dental floss, I'm used to that. You take someone else, they're in panic. It's like, whoa, no chance. You know? So I'm so used to this high performance, high pressure stuff. For me, it's the norm. And so the challenge is, and I said we were speaking, like often when people come off a workshop, it's like you've been, you've been drinking from a fire hydrant. It's like, okay, yeah, it's a lot. And I, I know I've shared a lot with you today. 
And so, for the work that we do, for you guys that have taken the time to be with us, uh, there is a document in your, in your uh, paper. We're going to give you 40% off the normal rates that we would offer typically to the market. And then, even after that, a percentage of the revenue will still go to the, the, the charity that we work with. So, if you can find ways to work with us, we're very easy. The answer is yes, whatever the question is. Now, let's just make it a win-win deal that everybody gets a, a win-win out of the deal. I have CDs for sale. I'm going to give you each these CDs here. Uh, the Revolutionary Workplace. I have a, I don't, I've made a CD for everybody. This is one of yours to take, not the others. The others are for sale. Um, but this is an MP3 and PDF. So if you're playing your card, you've got an MP3 or your PC. But it's an hour's recording on the, the ClearX system and some other background information that's there. Uh, we'd love to find a way to talk with you. If there's people that you can refer us to, we want to change the world, we want to change our country. I think it's so important that we get stuff to change in our country. Uh, I, I thank you for your time. It's been a blessing for me to be able to share this with you. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to, to come and chat to Emmanuel or myself. Um, we'll give you one of these CDs on the way out there. Please go safe. If you love somebody, show them. If you value them, tell them. And if you see value in the work that we do, can can be part of your network or people you can, you can take us into. We, we'd love to find a way to, to start to impact into a wider circuit of potential. Yes. We have about 45 um, uh, yes. uh, different client premises. And everything we do is custom designed. There's nothing off the shelf that's this hard. That's what it is. It's absolutely what's in front of us, what do you want to change, and it gets custom designed for your specific thing. Thank you, Norman.